today, we're learning, we're learning a lot about the Samaritan woman. I had only planned to do one message on the Samaritan woman's encounter with Jesus, and I got so excited that we expanded it into a, a three-part set, like a little mini-series. And um, we're learning, obviously, now where you worship God, that matters. It, all that matters is that you worship God. Jesus is saying the time is coming and it's here now that you won't have to worry about where you go to worship to be right with God. That's not going to be important. What's going to be important is that you worship God in your heart, in, in spirit, and in truth. Just do it in a way that's truthful and honest and pure, and that's what's going to matter. We're also learning that Jesus was a, a revolutionist against the law of not associating with people who weren't the same. You know, and listen, I, we're going to talk about that balance today a little bit. And because uh, a lot of times when I give my messages, you, you folks know me by now if you've been coming here any length of time. But I am a shock value preacher. Always have been. I have been for 20-something years. And I might say something that shocks you. And I will continue to probably say things that shock you. But I want you to know when I say a shock value statement that I will come back and balance it out so that you're not confused or you perceive something that isn't there because I believe very strongly in opening up our hearts to people that are different than us, believe different than we do, um, have a different moral code than we do because Jesus did that. But at the same time, holding on to the truth uh, and the morality of what the scriptures say for our own personal lives. And I think sometimes in society it's an all or nothing thing to where if you associate with people that are different than you, then you are accepting people that are different than you. You're accepting their lifestyle, you're accepting their, maybe their, uh, their other religion or something. And that's definitely not true. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to connect with the, those that are sexually immoral so that, and, and because I'm going to let them know that it's okay to be sexually immoral. Jesus didn't believe that. He believed that, that we needed to follow the code that the scriptures talked about in our sexuality, but he still connected with them, helped them, even befriended them, reached out to them, and so that we got to find that balance. And a lot of times we're all or nothing. We're 100% or 0%, and that's not how God wants us to be. Because people are going to be a different denomination than you. They're going to be a different gender than you, a different culture than you, and they're going to have different moral values than you do. Have you ever met someone that doesn't have biblical values? Please raise your hand. Good. Then we've got a mission. If you didn't raise your hand, you need to get out of your Christian bubble a little bit, all right? So there's people out there that, that don't believe uh, in, in biblical living. We believe in biblical living, those that are following Christ, and, it's, and we still don't always follow it completely. We, it's our goal to do that, and it's our heart to do that, but uh, there's a lot of people that don't follow the biblical values, and man, they'll let you know that they don't follow the biblical values, and they're kind of proud of that. So, Now, we're talking about the story of the, the um, Samaritan woman, and Jesus is on his way back from Jerusalem to Galilee where he lives. So he's going from the far south of Israel to the far north, and in the middle is uh, Samaria. And so good religious Jews, whether you're from Galilee or from, from Judea, in the north and the south, you didn't go through Samaria. That was just a no zone. You didn't travel through there because there was such racial and uh, cultural bias, and they didn't like each other. It's just the way it had been for, you know, hundreds if not a thousand years, you know, if I go back, it'd be 1,400 years before Jesus, that they just didn't like each other. 1,400 years is a long time, folks, to have a, a, a racial bias or an ethnic bias against a certain group of people that lived right next door to you. So, uh, so it was very built up, and a good religious Jews didn't go through Samaria. They went around Samaria. The problem with Jesus is he wasn't very good at being religious. And so what he did is say, no, we're going right through Samaria because this is the main territory I need to be. I, I, I'm not here for just the good Jewish practitioners of the Torah uh, and the way that, that the Jews practice it. I am here for everyone. I'm here for the Jews first because God is coming through the Jewish people to reach the world 
all people. So he said, I, I am a Jewish person myself, and I'm going to start there so it can spread to others. But he wasn't afraid to hop off to a Roman soldier, or hop off to someone who lived across the other way, the Sea of Galilee that was a Gentile, uh, et cetera, et cetera. He, a Samaritan woman at a well, wasn't afraid to jump off uh, when he wasn't supposed to. This was such a rivalry between the Samaritans and the Jews that there was one time that the religious scholars and the religious establishment was so upset with Jesus, they were so mad at him in, in a debate that they were having that they called Jesus a demon-possessed Samaritan. That's what they called him. Not only are you demon-possessed and you follow the devil, and the devil gives you your power, but you're from Samaria. Now, most people, when they would have heard, like, you're demon-possessed, we think, oh, that's, that's horrible. I can't believe they said that about Jesus. That's the ultimate slam. <laughs> no. The ultimate slam was they said he was a Samaritan. <laughs> it's like, it's bad that he was, you know, they said that. But boy, when you say you're a Samaritan, boy, that was the, the biggest dig you could give to someone. And that's how upset that they were. And that's why later on, after they called Jesus a demon-possessed Samaritan, that he went on later and he said, let me tell you guys a story. And it was then he told the story of the good Samaritan. Not the demon-possessed Samaritan, but the good Samaritan. And Jesus was even implying that he was like the Good Samaritan, and we should be like the Good Samaritan to kind of um, offset that racial bias that was going on between Samaritans and Jews. You think I preach with shock value. Jesus had me quadrupled in shock value in some of the things that he said. So I don't think we fully understand how divided the Samaritans and, and Jews were. So what I'm going to do is part history lesson. I'm going to start with that, then we're going to finish with uh, a little bit of, of the principles of the Good Samaritan Woman in Jesus and finish up um, with some of that. So let's go back 725 years before Jesus, okay? So we're going to put a map up, and this map is a, a map of the uh, Assyrian invasion. We're going back 725 years before Jesus. So Israel is divided um, into two different lands at this time, okay? So got on the screen, but I'm going to point to it here. This is the uh, Assyrian nation in purple, and this is the nation uh, that wasn't the Assyrian nation until they conquered it. So the, the purple is where Assyria started. The green is what they became in their widest scope of conquering uh, the, the Middle East. Today, this is Iraq, and uh, some of this is Turkey in today's modern map, and, uh, and, and it expands here, and it goes all the way down into Lebanon and Syria, and then you'll see the northern part of Israel. The southern part of Israel, which was called Judah, two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, consisted of the southern kingdom of Judah. The other 10 tribes of the 12 tribes of Israel were considered the northern kingdom of Israel. And you will see Samaria is in the northern kingdom of Israel, and they were conquered by the Assyrians, but the Assyrians didn't get down to conquer the Jews or Judah because they made a kind of a pact or a treaty uh, with the king of Judah, and so they remained free and just paid some taxes, but they weren't conquered per se, all right, by the, in the original uh, Assyrian thrust. And so we have all of these, in fact, the ten tribes of Israel that the Assyria came, they ended up displacing many of the Israelites and taking them back to Assyria to live. That's what you did when you conquered a nation. You took a lot of them back to your home country. And so what happened <clears throat> during that time was many people were, were taken out of, a, of Assyria and there were some that, that remained around. How many people have heard the term the lost tribes of Israel? Some of you have heard that term. What that's referring to is that when these ten tribes were taken out of Assyria, they were scattered and they never reformed per se. And so they're called the lost tribes because those ten tribes never really came back together and they're called the ten lost tribes of Israel. So a, a little uh, about that. Now, 125 years after Assyria came down. There was a, a, a nation or an empire called Babylon that uh, conquered Assyria. Okay, and so the Babylonians now had all the same land the Assyrians did, and the Babylonians came down 125 years after Israel was taken captive, and then. Judah was conquered as well by the Babylonians. You've heard of Nebuchadnezzar. He was the king at the time when Judah, which is in the brown on your map, was uh, then uh, eventually 
conquered and taken over. So let's look at some key dates that took place, and we'll put those up. In 586, the Babylonians destroy the temple, and the exile is complete. So Israel's already scattered up north. That happened 125 years before. Then in 586, the Babylonians complete the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem. They destroy the temple. They take all the artifacts that are out of there, and the exile begins where people are pulled out of Judah back to Babylon as well. Okay? So that happened. And then in 539, the Persians conquer the Babylonians. And so the Persians were nice to the Jews. And what the Persians did... Um, and King Xerxes was a Persian, but what the Persians did is they allowed Israel to go back and form their nation again. They said, listen, we don't, we, we want to we have the conquered land, but we want you guys to go back to your homeland and rebuild it. It's in shambles. You guys can go back. So the Persians were very nice, and the Jews began to return to Judah, okay, and rebuild Jerusalem. So a little timeline, if we go to the next slide, We've got a, in 516, Zerubbabel, have I say Zerubbabel? Because it's fun to say. Zerubbabel, that'd be cool if you named your next boy Zerubbabel. Do that, we'll call him Z, okay? Zerubbabel completes the new temple in Jerusalem. So Zerubbabel came back, and he actually said, the temple's in shambles, I'm going to build a new temple. And he got all these guys to help him. It was way less elaborate than the original temple that Solomon had built. He couldn't even touch it. In fact, it said that the old men in Israel were weeping because the temple was so small and tiny, but at least they had a temple. And then in 443 BC, this was some time later, Nehemiah builds the walls up of Jerusalem, and then Ezra reestablished Judaism. So we have Zerubbabel establishing the temple, we have Nehemiah building up the defensive walls for military purposes, and then Ezra was the scribe who came back and said, we are going to follow after the Torah and become a Juda uh, Judaism nation one once again. And so Ezra was responsible. They would, they would proclaim the law in Jerusalem, you know, every day, and they would read from the scriptures to get the people, they, because they had forgot their religion. They had forgotten about God. They forgot about the Torah. They forgot about Jehovah. And so they reestablished that under Ezra. But the Samaritan Jews, the Samaritan Jews, some of them had stayed permanently in the land through Assyria, through Babylon, throughout. they stayed there and they established and kept Judaism going longer than the Jews that came back from Babylon. So they said, listen, we've been here the whole time. We didn't get carried off to some foreign land and come back and try to establish Judaism. We've been here the whole time, and we've got the right version of Judaism. We've got a handle on what Judaism is. You guys forgotten or trying to reestablish it. We've been here the whole time. We're the right denomination. And that's why the Samaritans were so defiant against the Jews that came back in Jerusalem because you guys don't have the right version. And thank God that hasn't happened in Christianity because we don't have different denominations in Christianity. Oh, wait, yeah, we do. We got, we got a few here and there. That was one of my sarcastic jokes. So anyway, we've ended up doing the same thing, you know, in Christianity, creating denominations, which again, remember this, denominations are not bad. Denominationalism, denominationalism is what kills, and that's what you have to stay. Nothing wrong with going to a denominational church. It's just to not make sure denominationalism doesn't happen, even at Hoosier Harvest, which is non-denominational. But we can say, well, Hoosier Harvest Church has got it on, but that church down the road doesn't have it going on. You need to be, you need to be careful with that. You need to be quiet. When you say that, you don't put down other folks that are worshiping God and, and Christ in, in a different format than what we do. Oh, their music stinks down there. Well, you, you know, shut up. You know, if people find and, and find uh, Christ through old hymns or, you know, a cappella, or they don't play this or they don't do that or they preach a certain way, they baptize a certain way. But ladies and gentlemen, they are following after Jesus Christ, so let's just applaud that and say, hey man, go for it. Here's how our church uses this method, but it's just our method. It's not our doctrine. It's not our, we've got to be real careful with how we approach that. And you know, I've preached a million sermons on that. So a new, a, 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 there were two different denominations, Samaritanism and Judaism were formed. And they built a temple on Mount Gerizim in Samaria and they, they worshiped there, and then the Jews built in Jerusalem. So we had Mount Gerizim, and, and we also had Jerusalem as the two places of worship for the Samaritans and the Jews. Now, when the Persians took over, they conquered the Babylonians. So let's show, that's what the, that's what the Persians look like. How many people have seen the movie 300? Okay. <laughs> About 90% guy hands. Oh, 
You know, that, I'll tell you what, man, Leonidas rocks, man. That's all I'm going to say. I'm going to leave it at that. That's me and, me and my son, like 300. So anyway, this is what they look like. I could have put what they look like in the movie, but this was more realistic. Okay, the Persians. The Persians were then in turn conquered... Um, uh, they conquered the Babylonians, but then the Greeks conquered the Persians. This is what the Greeks... Now, that's Leonidas, man. Come on. That's Leonidas. That's what the Greeks look like. It's a Greek soldier. But then guess who the Greeks were conquered by? They were conquered by the Romans. And so the Romans came along, and so we have all these nations that are conquering, and Israel was never free. They were... They were under Babylonian rule, then they were under Greek rule, then they were under Roman rule. They had about a 50-year span when they were free because the Maccabean revolt took place. A bunch of Jews rebelled against the Greeks, and they had some form of freedom for about 50, 70 years, which was wonderful, but then it got crushed, and uh, the Greeks and the Romans took over again. And so now that puts us in Jesus' day. I wanted to say all that, bringing you up to the point where we're in Jesus' day now. The Romans are there. They hate the Romans. They hated the Greeks before them. Uh, they, they didn't like the Babylonians and the Persians either, but they were always under. Now, could you imagine this? Could you imagine the United States? Think about this. Let me put this in perspective. You live in the United States. Say that we were in the United States and we were under foreign rule. We, we weren't, you know, Russia was in charge of us, or, you know, I don't know, uh, Germany or England, or well, England was at one time, but all these nations were, were in control of the United States, and we weren't free for 600 years. Let me say that again. I don't think you heard that. 600 years, Israel was not free. Israel was under foreign occupation. Could you imagine the United States being, we're not even, we're 250 years old as a nation. 600 years! Israel was suppressed by the, the Babylonians, the Assyrians even before that, the Babylonians, then the, then the Persians, then the Greeks, then the Romans. 600 years, no freedom. Paying taxes to a foreign poor. 600 years, that's, that's a long time. So you can see why they were looking forward to the promise of a Messiah. 600 years. Messiah, help us out. It's been 600 years since, you know, we've, we've had to pay taxes and do this and be under suppression. We, can't, we have no self-rule. We, we can't do anything that we want to do, and our children can't do anything. Would you come and save us? You can see why they were really looking forward to the Messiah, because they thought the Messiah would be a political freedom. And so that brings us up to the point in John chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. The Scripture says this. So Jesus left the Judean countryside and went back to Galilee. But to get there, he had to pass through Samaria. And again, he didn't have to. He chose to. But he felt like he had to because there was something pressing that he needed to do. And I feel like part of the reason that he felt like he had to go to Samaria was because he needed to tell this story. He needed to see that Samaritan woman. He needed to plant uh, a thought in her mind to where it's, it's and, and, and maybe start a revolution in Samaria that it's not about where you worship, it's just about that you worship God. And I think we have this story in our scriptures so that we would know about it today. We could learn about it more today. It could be a lesson to us today on how to live in today's society as well. So he had to go through Samaria because he had that divine appointment waiting. And listen, let me say this about divine appointments. You can't predict them. You don't, otherwise it wouldn't be divine. It would be your appointment. You can't predict them. I'm really big on divine appointments. You've heard me talk about them many times. What I'm saying is put yourself out there, whether it's at work or whether it's, you know, the volunteer things that you do or whether it's just with your family, it's your extended family, it's this, it's your neighbors and coworkers, whatever it is, you just live your life like you can go in the grocery store, whatever you do, and just keep your antennas up because something may happen where a divine appointment and you, you run into somebody that you're supposed to run into. And I believe that this is what Jesus was doing. Because when we go out there and we say, God, I'm open, and God knows that we're open, because I believe divine appointments are always coming toward us, but I believe a lot of times we have our, our radio dialed into the wrong place, and we're not picking up the signal, and we pass by a lot of divine appointments. God's sending people, but we're just like, doink, 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 doink. Pay attention. Because there's always divine appointments. If you really want to be an extension of Jesus Christ and, and a helper to him, Pay attention and be ready and, and recognize if you're, if you're having that conversation with someone that you know or someone maybe that you don't know. Just pay attention because God will constantly bring those to you. That's why it's important for you to come to HHC every Sunday that you can. I'm a big believer that there are divine appointments when you come here 
on a Sunday morning that you just, well, it's the world out there. That I'm, no, you're supposed to have divine appointments with each other as well. We're supposed to take care of each other first and then take care of those that are out, out there. Okay, that's what family does. So you're going to have divine appointments just by walking in the doors, and you don't want to miss a Sunday. You might miss a divine appointment. That's a great advertisement for attendance, isn't it? <laughs> so we have to look at divine appointments in this. We don't want to miss any potential. And sometimes divine appointments are doing what's right just where you happen to be. Just do what's right. You know, it's, it's just like um, there's, a, there's a guy I read about not long ago, and his name's Greg, Greg Isaias is his name. And he was hiking in the Santa Ana Mountains, and he heard this scream way down the trail path that he was walking. And when he ran there, there was a woman that was just in complete terror and on her knees and bawling and screaming, and he couldn't understand a word she was saying. And she, she pointed. And Greg Isaias looked, and this woman's five-year-old daughter, there was a mountain lion who had her head in its mouth and had dragged her away. And there was blood everywhere. And the mountain lion was just dragging her away and taking off. Greg Isaias had a divine appointment. He was just trying to have a trail walk. That's all he was doing. But he had a divine appointment and he reacted. And what he did is he, he, he grabbed a huge limb that he could barely pick up and he went after the mountain lion who was running away. And he caught the mountain lion, and he beat the mountain lion with the limb, risking his own life until that little girl was dropped, and it ran off. And that little girl barely survived. She was paralyzed, not, but she lived. And Greg Isaias was at the right place at the right time. He didn't know it, but he just reacted to where he was. He did something in the moment to where he was at. And folks, it might not always be that dramatic, obviously, but if you're at the right place at the right time then, and you respond to something that, that, that's going on in the right manner, uh, you might save somebody's life. You might improve somebody's life. You might make a, a, a tremendous difference in the things that you do. So divine appointment, his divine appointment was challenging but it was life-saving. You know, Jesus was also willing to do brave things to save lives, just like Greg Isaias. He was willing to go into Samaria. He said, I'm going to do a brave thing. I don't know what, you know, here's, here we go. I'm going to do a brave thing. He went in, had the divine appointment, and I believe he saved that woman's life. Now, here's the thing is I've always found curious about the Bible. There wasn't a Bible volume two written. It's just we have the Bible that we have, and that's good. That's, that's what we are supposed to have for our dispensation, the age that we live in. We have the, the text that we need to, to live our lives and, and connect with God. That's all that matters. But have you, I, I, I'm just this way. I, I think what happened to the Samaritan woman after that encounter? We have no record. I believe something happened with that Samaritan woman. I believe her life was changed. We don't have a record of really what happened to Nicodemus when he came to Jesus at night, and he was part of the Sanhedrin. He was part of the great council. He was a Pharisee who wanted to learn more about Jesus, and he met Jesus at night, and Jesus told him a truth about God, and, and it changed Nicodemus' heart. But we don't hear about Nicodemus, but I'm just betting you that Nicodemus had a big part to play after Jesus rose and ascended to the Father, because... He encountered Jesus like the Samaritan woman encountered Jesus. I wonder maybe what happened to the Roman soldier who was at the cross of Jesus. And he looked up when he, and he had a realization, a revelation. He said, wait a this isn't a regular criminal. And this is what the Roman soldier said. He said, truly this is the Son of God. He had some kind of inner, relation, uh, inner revelation like Peter did when Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The Roman soldier had the same thing. He said, whoa, 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 whoa I, I feel something. This is, this is the Son of God. The Son of God. It's not just a criminal. He's somebody. He's somebody supernatural, somebody important. I wonder what happened to that Roman soldier. We don't have any record of it unless you watch the movie called The Robe. And then some of you, you know, they made a movie about that Roman soldier, and, and it's fictional. But, but you, you wonder that he didn't have an impact because he had a personal encounter right there at the cross with Jesus Christ. You wonder about Lazarus. He was raised from the dead. What happened to him afterwards? We know he died again. Everybody dies, you know, physically again. But what, what was his role? We, I wonder about Mary Magdalene. 
what, what, you know, how, how she was impacted. I think about the men that were walking on the road to Emmaus after Jesus resurrected from the dead, and he was walking with this, these men, and they were talking about the things that had happened where, you know, Jesus was, had risen from the dead, and they didn't know what to think of it, and Jesus came and talked to them, and they didn't even know it was him. But then they knew it was him once, once he kind of disappeared out of their, out of the, out of their sight. What happened to those men? I believe something extraordinary and amazing happened to them after. And I believe they were a big vessel in promoting the gospel. The reason that I believe that is this. Because you cannot directly encounter Jesus and never be the same again. You can't do it. You can't directly. There's a lot of people that indirectly encounter Jesus. Oh, I've heard of Jesus. Yeah. Oh, I went to church and heard about him. But if, when you have an encounter with Jesus, you will never be the same again. Boy, I, I wonder if that person's saved or not. I, don't, I wonder if they're saved. I don't know if they're saved. They might be saved. I don't know. You don't need to worry about it. Because if they've had an encounter with Jesus, they are never going to be the same again. They're not, they're not going to be necessarily be perfect, but you can't be the same again when you encounter Jesus, just like these people. And so I just want to say that a little bit about the background, divine appointments, so forth. They're, they're amazing. You've had a divine appointment with Jesus, and some of you, most of you, if not a large majority of you, have met that appointment. But let me go back to the story to, to finish up. Jesus in Samaria. So everyone outside of Samaria didn't like Samaria. You mentioned the Samaritans, and everybody went, uh, uh, oh, you know. The, the, the Samaritans didn't like the Sadducees. You said something to the, the Pharisees about the Sadducees, they went, uh, yeah, they had to work together, but they didn't like each other. The Sadducees didn't like the Zealots. The Zealots were the ones that were trying to, they were the military, you know, rebels that were trying to overthrow the Roman government. The Sadducees were trying to negotiate with the Romans, and the Zealots were trying to kill the Romans. So when, the, when you said to the Sadducees, oh, the Zealots, they went, yeah. But the Zealots, they didn't, they, they couldn't stand the Essenes, because the Essenes were another denomination different way of thinking, that lived out by the Dead Sea, and they were like the monks of Judaism. They just had a closed community, they lived simple, they studied the scriptures, like a commune kind of, like, like monks lived, except they had their families with them. And the zealots were like, let's overthrow the Romans, let's not go put our head in the sand out in the Dead Sea, you know, area, and just live like nothing's happening. So they, the zealots would go, uh. And of course, no one liked the Romans. The Romans were like, everybody was like, eh. You know, so there's all this, uh, uh, you know, all these things going on. And so the bottom line is, Jesus didn't, uh, with any of these groups. In fact, Jesus had divine appointments with all of these groups. He said, God, I don't want to, uh, with these groups. I want to have divine appointments. And he held to his message and values. He gave them the grace and the truth of God. But he also did it in a way that didn't put them off or didn't isolate them from, eh. Jesus could have said, oh, you're a zealot? Eh. Oh, you're, oh, you're a Samaritan? Eh. You're a Sadducee? Eh. See, because that's, there's an instant separation. Whether you say it out loud or you do it in your heart, there's an instant separation. And Jesus refused to, eh, with anybody. Great lesson for all of us, because there are people that you don't think the same as. There are people that have different values than you do, and Jesus had different values than a lot of these people as well. But folks, HHC is a city of refuge. A city of refuge, it, did, it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter what you've done. This is a safe haven from your past. This is a place where you are welcome. It doesn't matter where you are in your life, you are welcome here. So when someone who is Catholic comes in here, we don't go, oh, you're Catholic, and all that Virgin Mary stuff, right? And everybody goes, ooh, Virgin Mary, and everybody wants to fight, you know. <laughs> it's like Jesus didn't do that. He goes, oh, you believe this way? Let's fight about it. Let's debate about it. We, we've gone crazy with debate. Some of you need to get off of social media and quit yelling at people on social media and debating people on social media. Can I get an amen for that? It's like, just it's clam down. You don't have to show everybody how smart you are. <clears throat> Boy, I feel frisky, don't I? <laughs> well, I'm just, when I get up here, I just speak the truth and do a little shock value. Now, when someone comes in this Catholic, we don't go, uh. When someone who comes in here 
with an addiction, we're not going to go, ooh. You know, someone comes in here with a diff different ethnic background, there's not going to be any is. There's, there's no place for that. There, it, that. That doesn't matter. Even if you are from Mooresville, Bloomington, or Brown County, we're not going to go, mm. And I know that's a big step, okay? But no, I'm proud that we have so many people from a variety of areas. We have people coming at one point, we had people coming from six different counties to this church. And I think part of the reason is because we don't go, ugh. It doesn't matter where you've been. What matters is where you're going, and we're going to sell Jesus to you. We're going to point you to Jesus, and that's what it's all about. Can I get an amen from anybody? That's what we're about. And Jesus is always looking for someone to go to Samaria with him. He's like, who will go to Samaria? Well, we're not going to Samaria. We want to go to Hoosier Harvest. <laughs> that's safe. That's fun. I mean, they rock. They got a pastor that actually goes by the name of Crispy. Man, it's just different, man. It's just radical. It's just, I don't... But Jesus is always saying, well, there's nothing wrong with hanging because we're family and we need to hang. We need to rally. We need to have a pep session on Sunday mornings. But then Jesus is saying, man, just be open to go to Samaria with me from time to time. You don't have to live there. You don't have to go there every day. But there's going to be times I'm going to put you in Samaria. And I, want you, I don't want you to go, ugh. I mean, I'm guilty of that. I've seen things on television before of like a certain lifestyle that I don't like or certain moral values that I don't like. And I go, and, I, and, and you know, Dana will tell you this. I always go, ugh. And I go, I got to practice what I preach. I'm just being honest. It's a challenge because you, you know, you want everyone to, to have what you have or believe what you believe. And, and, I, and I got that. But Jesus is always looking for people to go to Samaria. Now, what you're going to risk if you dare to venture into Samaria, here's what you're going to risk from other Christians, from family members, people going, what are you doing talking to the Samaritan? Ugh. Ugh. Why are you hanging with them? Ugh. The disciples did that when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well. They said, Jesus, what are you doing? Ugh. She's a Samaritan. Ah! She's a woman. Whoa! She's been married five times. Ah! I mean, there's just a lot of crazy going on here. Jesus, what are you doing? These were from his followers. These weren't from other people. So you got to risk that. But you know what Jesus was into? He didn't really care about the ooh and the ahs and the uh. What he cared about was rescuing people. He didn't care about background or this or that or where you are. He just cared about rescuing people. He was trying to rescue the woman, give her some truth. Rescue her, help her, help her heart. So what it, she didn't have to receive it, but he was still going to just be himself and be kind and be friendly and speak truth. I don't know why Christians can't do that. It's not, it's not difficult. We get riled up. We get mad. Jesus turned over the tables one time because of religiosity. And some of you are out there turning tables every day. Cut it out. You don't be so mad. Just, you know, you watch, you guys watch the national news and you guys do circles in your, in your living room. Relax. Quit turning over tables and everything, da, 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 you know, Jesus is in control. You know, we think because somebody's this or somebody's a leader of this nation, then, oh, it's going to relax. How many people know God's still in control? Yeah. Even though some things can be out of control that are, you know, sin or pride of, of people or nations and this, I got that. But in the end, you know, Jesus, I'm staying under Jesus and I'm, I'm going I'm to, you know, come hell or high water, I'm following him. I'm not going to necessarily follow any other person. I'll support people. I'll pray for the president. I'll do, do, do. I'm for the United States. I'm patriotic. I'm all that kind of stuff. But Jesus is my only anchor, as we sing about today. I'm going to stick with that. And I'm okay with that. And on the side, I'll support all these things. I'll support my nation. I love my country. You got to just rescue folks. If Billy falls over the railing of the ship, we don't check to see if he's Baptist or atheist on the way down. <laughs> hey, are you Baptist? I He's dead. Just, just say Billy. Don't ask questions. Just say, you know, I did a, I did a message called Pass the Rope a, a few years ago. And it was about a fella named Arlen Williams. Let's put his picture up on the screen. Arlen Williams. He's, a, he's an amazing dude. Um, because back in 1982, when Air Florida Flight 90 left Washington, D.C., it only got about a few hundred feet off the ground and it iced over and it crashed into a bridge over the Potomac River then it plunged in the Potomac. 73 of the 79 people on board were killed instantly. Six people survived and they were floating in the Potomac River. 
And so a rescue helicopter finally came just a few minutes before hypothermia set into the, the rest of the survivors because it was an icy river. And so every time that they dropped a rope, the first person they dropped it to was Arlen Williams. And Arlen Williams, every time he got the rope, he passed it to another survivor so they could be freed. All five survivors ended up surviving, or that, that were surviving into the Potomac, that were still alive, ended up surviving, except for Arlen Williams. He went down with the tail of the ship because they couldn't get back in time to get him. And folks, to me, Arlen didn't grab the rope. He didn't say, hey, you Republican or Democrat before I pass this to you. He didn't care. Hey, man, you, are you straight or gay before I pass this rope? It didn't matter. Pastor, hey, man, are you white or black? It, it didn't matter. He passed the rope. Now, here's what's amazing about Arlen Williams. That I, he's, my, he's one of my personal heroes. Arlen Williams suffered from a condition called aquaphobia, a fear of water, fear of drowning. He had a, a heightened sense of that, and he still passed the rope. Are you kidding me? I want to be like Arlen Williams. Man, if it costs me my life, so be it. I'm okay with that. It cost Jesus his life to rescue and save people. It cost Arlen Williams his life. I mean, it cost me my life, and maybe you're saying out there, if it cost me my life, so be it. I don't, rarely will that happen. Well, it will cost you your life. But if it does, so be it. Because Arlen Williams did what Jesus would do and did what Jesus did. Let me say this and end with this. Hanging with the Samaritans really confuses the religious crowd. It confuses the religious crowd who don't accept anybody or anything. That's the religious crowd. They only accept them and all the details that they believe. So we, we, when we hang with Samaritans, it really confuses the people out there. Good. I hope it does. But then on the other hand, hanging, the next slide, and holding to biblical and moral values really confuses society who accepts everything. So you, if you want to, you got the religious side who just only accepts their little box of things, then you got society who accepts everything, just be what you want. If you want to, you know, if you want to marry that tree, marry that tree. That's fine with me. I think that's wonderful. You know, they accept everything. But what we're called to be, ladies and gentlemen, as followers of Jesus Christ, is right in the middle, because that's where Jesus was. He said, I'm not going to be with, I'm not going to just be the religious crowd. I'm not going to be the society crowd. I am going to be right in the middle. And I am going to connect with the Samaritans, but I'm going to hold on to my biblical standards. You don't have to live in Samaria. In Samaria you just don't ignore it. I'm going to finish with this great scripture. The music team, I'm going to have you come up. Listen to this scripture. This is a great scripture, and I'm going to read out of the message version, which is kind of the gangster version of the Bible. <laughs> Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23. This is what Paul, Paul wrote, a, a real winner here. Even though I am free of the demands and expectations of everyone, I'm free. I don't care what people think of me. I'm in Christ. Then he goes on to say, I have voluntarily, everyone say voluntarily, voluntarily become a servant to any and all in order to, everybody say reach, reach a wide range of people. Next slide says this. Eventually. There it is. And here's the people that I'm going to reach. Religious, non-religious, meticulous moralists, loose living immoralists, people that just live crazy, and the defeated, the demoralized, whoever. Then it goes on to say this. I didn't take on their way of life. I kept my bearings in Christ. Here's what Paul is saying. I, I'll reach out to anybody, but I'm not going to give up my Christ-following morals. But I'm going to reach out. Perfect balance. It goes, it goes on to say this. But I entered their world and tried to experience things from their point of view. And then finally it says this. I become just about every sort of servant there is in my attempts to lead those I meet into a God-saved life. Can I get an amen from anyone? That's called balance. That's balance. Let's stand.
We can learn a lot from a brief encounter between the Son of God, Jesus of Nazareth, and a woman just coming to get water from the watering hole. There is a lot that happened. There is a lot of lessons learned, a lot of things to understand, a lot of balance to be had. And my heart for all of you at HHC is to live that balanced lifestyle. I want you to be full of the Holy Spirit. I want you to be led by Christ. I want Him to be your pattern. I want God to be everything to you. I want you to live biblically because that's the best way to live, the safest way to live, and it pleases God. There's, there's no reason not to live biblically. It can be challenging, but, but don't ever be in the bubble. I'm going to pray, and as we pray, when we conclude, then we're going to have people that are going to be available here uh, in the altar if you need personal prayer. And some of you do. Some of you just need to say, man, I just got something going on. I just need to touch base with somebody and agree. Some of you, man, I, you know, and I don't believe salvation just happens in a prayer on a Sunday morning. There's times that we'll pray for salvation, but we don't do that every Sunday. I don't want to get into a ritual of that because I believe that people follow Christ and people become Christians just a lot of times by osmosis. There needs to be a time where you make a decision to follow Christ. Don't get me wrong. I believe in a decision for Christ. And that decision then is followed up by water baptism because that's kind of like the wedding ceremony of you, you know, committing to Christ. And it's, a, it's an amazing, awesome thing. Okay, so you need to make that point where you turn the corner. But I know some of you haven't turned the corner yet to where you're just all in with Jesus. But you're getting there. And on some Sundays, it's going to be your day. Other Sundays, you need a little bit more time to grow a little bit closer to make that decision. I understand that. But we want you to make that decision at some time in your life because it's the best decision you'll make 50 billion times over in your life because it deals with eternity and nothing else does. It's the only decision that you'll make that deals with eternity. It's important. Eternity is a long time. It's our understanding of the scriptures. I don't even know what eternity means. I just know it's a long time. It's just outside of the scope of time. But if Jesus said this is what he did for us and to follow him and he'll give us this, eternal life, he'll forgive our sins, I'm in. But you have to believe it. And some of you are working on that. Some of you are there. I don't know. But whenever we pray at the end of service, and even if we don't pray specifically for salvation, if you make that turn, then make the turn. Okay? That's what we're looking for. And then tell us about it. We'll celebrate it with you. You won't be weird. Well, I can't say that, but... You can, you know, you, you, you don't turn into this weird guy that's going to have a bullhorn on the corner of the street when you follow after Christ. You don't be that guy. We don't, you know, if you do, don't wear your HAC t-shirt, please. <laughs> but at the same time, we want you to make that decision because your personality will stay the same, but man, you'll change from the inside out because you cannot have a direct encounter with Jesus Christ and be the same as we talked about. And that's our heart for you. I'm just saying that to the audience. I didn't plan on that, but... So keep that in mind each and every time we come together on Sunday. Let's pray. Father, we conclude our time with the Samaritan woman and Jesus, and we thank you for their encounter because their encounter is our encounter. We've learned a lot of hidden nuggets, and with your help, we are going to live in the middle. We're going to live in the middle of the religious crowd and society. We don't have to be like society, and we don't have to be like the religious crowd. We can be right in the middle where we, we have a, a hand reaching, Father, into everyone's world, but we stay centered in Christ. We stay centered in the Holy Spirit. We stay centered with the Scripture. And we thank you for those things that center us. With your help, we are going to live in that middle, just like Jesus stretched one hand into a spiritually suffering world, and the other hand, he lashed onto you. Let us also find that delicate balance so we can influence like Jesus did. Because we can't help anyone without your love and without you giving us a servant's heart. And finally, Father, for those that need to make a solid decision to follow after you, I know we had several people do that over the past couple of months because there was many people that went into the waters of baptism and said, I'm making a decision to follow after you. So, Father, I always want people to be baptized here and just as a conclusion to their decision in their heart that they're making now, or that they're going to make very soon in the near future. Father, it's not complicated. It's just saying, Jesus, I want you. I believe in you. I want to follow you. I believe you are the son of the living God. I understand my sin is separated 
myself from you and I know that Jesus you took care of the sin on the cross when I couldn't to reconnect me with God I accept that reconnection I accept your love I accept your change I accept your leadership I accept you as the Lord and the Savior of my life and so father let that be true for the people that are here today and father we celebrate with you each and every time that life has changed because life changes everything we pray this in Jesus name and everyone said Give Jesus a hand clap of praise. Give somebody a high five and a handshake on the way out. Folks, we will see you next Sunday.